clinical trials in individuals over than 75, so we just sort of don't list it. But as clinicians, do we give up when the patient gets to 75 and say, that's it, throw our hands up, uh, you're on your own? Or what do you do as a clinician when you get somebody who crosses that bar and is now 76? So, uh, can I sit down now? <laughs> okay. So, uh, the uh, important part of that is here. So, for primary prevention, that is um, answered relatively uh, in a straightforward manner. Over here is uh, simply have a clinical assessment and a risk discussion with them and decide what to, what to do. And look at these risk enhancers uh, that you can look for everybody else. And I, um, I have several 90-year-olds. In fact, I saw a lady yesterday that was 98, walked into her own appointment, uh, still lives at home by herself. So they, they, get, they get everything that everybody else gets. And I, I, I use some of the trials that show that even within one year, there's a reduction in atherosclerotic plaque. Um, I realize that's extrapolation, but that, if that's what, what I do. Within one year, there's reduction in what? Yeah, treating with a statin. With a statin. Yeah. Okay. And even if you look at the AIM high data, if you look at the Timmy uh, uh, data on acute coronary syndrome, there's even a reduction in, in, in uh, complications within even the hospital admission with high dose statin. Um, so then for secondary prevention, it gets a little bit more uh, clear in the new guidelines that over 75, um, that it gets a class two and you're you're covered, if you will. Um, and so this puts, in my mind, this puts to rest all the people that said, I'm not giving an 80-year-old status because now at least it's in the new guidelines, especially if it's secondary prevention. Um, I see another hand. Yeah, the South, you're looking in the just enterprises. Um, so the problem, I think, with people over 75 is most of them have multiple comorbidities. If you look at the progression after 65, it's one or two per year, it seems. And there are no trials, as you said, for people over 75 because they're complicated. And so the whole idea of number needed to treat and all of the drug-drug interaction, all that stuff comes into play. So it has to be very individualized for people over 75, and they have to be almost always relatively uncomplicated in order to consider this, I think, because you're just going to add to the public pharmacy, and that often doesn't do anything. So I, yeah, I think that over 75, you just have to be ultra careful. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't emphasize enough. To me, they need to be mentally clear, alert. They need to have all of the benefits of living longer, and uh, and then and then have those risk discussions. Unless it's secondary prevention, and then now that's in the new guidelines that you have the option to treat. So, do you have anything else to add to that? Um, so that was your question. Next you question. Don't get to add. No, no, no. <laughs> Just don't get to be seventy-five. <laughs> <laughs> Draw the line at that point. Um, so the other is there are new things on the block, like isopent uh, ethyl, pentoic uh, <coughs> acid, uh, that offer even further benefits behind, beyond statins and other things for uh, dyslipidemia. Do you see that we'll be looking at those soon? Because the results in the trials have been very positive. Um. Of course, and um, I, right now the name escapes me, but there's a new treatment for lipoprotein little a that is expected to come out here soon. And so, um, I, yes, I mean, I, I think that um, for the number one killer, uh, except for in some states, cancer uh, beats out heart disease uh, now. Uh, I always remember Dr. Kim Williams, uh, Kim Williams said that while he was ACC president, he wanted to make heart disease number two, and he only succeeded in some regions. But in any case, for the, for the number one uh, killer in the United States, uh, I think any additional treatments are welcome from my perspective. So, but, and then again, with the focus on diet and lifestyle being the primary reason, the primary uh, treatment for most, so the overall cost savings in my mind would be if you truly implement diet and lifestyle for as many people as you can, plus add in higher dollar therapies, I'm optimistic that if we do that smartly, we'll actually still not okay. Yeah. So 
First of all, um, my name is Andy Cope, American Heart Association. I work in quality and systems improvement on the hospital side, stroke, and other things. But I want to first thank you for presenting the, the latest guideline changes and something from American Heart and the other groups. But I think um, to dovetail what you were just talking about, patients and, and so forth, it's a lot about patient compliance too, right? They're going to sit with you and listen to you and follow through. And um, though my cohorts who are in community development aren't here today can make it, um, we do provide at AHA a lot of different avenues for the patients to track progress, um, get additional information, and so forth. I can get you a further, deeper list. Maybe we can distribute it from them. But just to let you know that that's just as important around blood pressure, target blood pressure, check change control around both, that and cholesterol. And then, of course, like you were saying, diet, tracking, all the other things that are really important. Because otherwise, the patient is the other part, right? You know, yes. the, you know, all this is great, but they have to be able to follow through, follow through with, with the, the, the doctors. Yeah. Yes? Can I ask one more question? Um, it seemed to me that the new guideline emphasized uh, the possible use of using non-fasting lipids um, as opposed to just fasting lipids, um, which seems would increase the number of people who got lipids done. And wondering if you had any thoughts about that or the relative pros and cons in your mind of using a fasting versus non-fasting. What, what they basically said is uh, non-fasting lipids are fine for most people. If your triglycerides over 400, you should go back and do a fasting. Yeah, and so for, for years I've drawn non-fasting lipids and our lab does too. It, it's very rare that you have that situation where you, where you need to reach out uh, if it's gonna make, if it's gonna end up making a difference. Um, and, but then as you appropriately pointed out, the fine print says reach out to the triglycerides over. I don't think that's trickled well down into the general practice. Oh, you have to be fasting, and they'll send them away. And, and uh, but we, we we try and stay on top of that because yes, it does increase your ability to get a lipid value, uh, of, uh, especially LDL and HDL, to be able to initiate treatment. So, what kind of a difference do you see in non-fasting and fasting? So, the, the, this is this is well-published literature. I mean, it, it is as she just pointed out, uh, the, the triglycerides are the primary issue, and and rarely does it ever make a difference in treatment. Um, but if you, because even if you get another non-fasting, uh, most of the time you'll, you'll, you'll not have the same uh, elevation twice. Um, so you could, over, long, over the long period, you, you can end up being fine without, without necessarily having to do a redraw. Any other questions? But there are other things that come down the list as, as well. 
So when we talk about lifestyle modifications and multi-factor risk reduction, we need to consider all of these things that are there, including flu vaccine. Flu vaccine the, uh, significantly reduces your chance of having a heart attack uh, with that. So it is certainly included in this, and we can show and improve survival with just things like flu vaccine, as well as each of the other things shown here has been shown in a study to reduce cardiovascular risk or mortality in that situation. So multi-factor has to be the approach. And in our <coughs> clinics and other things, CDPH is focusing on multiple factors, not just one single factor, to reduce cardiovascular disease. So that's going to be important. So here was the patient that we had. And so what we would like to do is see if there are suggestions in this individual, what else can we do for this individual to reduce their risk? So anyone want to give a, and hopefully in the room we can pick off each of these. Any suggestions for this patient to add or subtract to this current profile? Do we know this BMI is? Uh, no, we don't have BMI in this situation, but yes, BMI is part of lifestyle reduction, and uh, I can tell you that most diabetics uh, have a BMI that is, uh, you know, that is greater than 25. So I think that if we say he's an average diabetic, it's probably a BMI of about 30. Ace and GLP-1. Pardon? ACE inhibitor and GLP-1. Okay, ACE inhibitor, yeah, ACE inhibitors have been shown. Now, ACE inhibitor is gonna lower blood pressure. Do you want a lower blood pressure from the, where is it, 138 there? Because yeah. in one of the trials, the airport trial, they looked at, um, in one of the diabetic trials, under 140 versus under 120, there was no difference in actual um, uh, major outcomes in that uh, trial. So in the diabetics, we haven't gotten as good data as we did in the SPRINT trial. And in the SPRINT trial, we excluded diabetics in that trial uh, for that. But what was important in that trial that showed no reduction in mortality, showed a reduction in strokes in the diabetics when we went from what, under 140 to under 120. So yes, I think an ACE inhibitor, which has been shown in diabetics to reduce cardiovascular disease and improve renal function prognosis as well, would be a good thing to add. So yes, ACE inhibitor would be there. Anything else? GLP-1. GLP-1, okay. So GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist, uh, <clears throat> so glucagon-like peptide receptor agonist uh, is actually shown uh, in the uh, liraglutide was shown to reduce uh, cardiovascular events. Overall events uh, significantly, about 14% and about a 22% reduction in cardiovascular death in that trial, which was called the leader trial in that situation you know, for that. Um, interesting <coughs> for that, that's a good point, but we also showed that this patient had heart failure. And in the liraglutide leader trial, there was no reduction in heart fail failure. So the question would be, if we add an additional anti-glycemic therapy, uh, would we want to choose one that had both cardiovascular risk reduction and heart failure reduction? Because we threw in here the recent hospitalization for heart failure. And in the LEADER trial with liraglutide, there was no reduction in heart failure, although there was a 22% uh, cardiovascular death reduction. Uh, so yes, if we were adding uh, a second agent for, uh, for glucose reduction, we might consider something else as well. Any other suggestions? SGLT2. So the SGLT2, as you said, uh, significantly reduces cardiovascular events across the board. Uh, and in the uh, approved one, uh, in the EMPA-REG trial, there was a significant reduction in cardiovascular death by 38%. 
and additional for this patient, a 35% reduction in heart failure admissions in that patient as well. And of course, an all-cause mortality reduction of 32% in that trial. And it modestly lowered uh, A1C. Not a lot, 0.7 to 0.8 uh, reduction in A1C percent uh, for it. But it seemed to be that no matter what the A1C was, there seemed to be a benefit across the board, suggesting that some of these medicines may have benefits in addition to their reduction in, uh, in glycemia. Yes. So would you add them both, or how important is A1C? Good question. So he has, we gave you an A1C of 9.2, and remember that the SGLT2 will lower at 0 0.7 to 0 0.8, uh, depending on the dose. So you do have room to come down further, and we do know that in other epidemiologic trials, lower A1C seems to be better. It has been difficult when we initially pushed with better control of glycemia. When we went for under seven, we actually had increased mortality in some of those trials. So we don't want to push too low because some of these benefits may be independent of A1C. So we want to have an A1C that doesn't give us hyperosmolar coma, that doesn't give us ketoacidosis, but at the same time, we don't want to push the low end because hypoglycemia could be one of the reasons for an increased mortality when we went to very low targets uh, in the past. So I, I think adding it one at a time would be reasonable so that we don't sort of get too close to hypoglycemia. The other thing is that both the GLP-1s uh, receptor agonists and the SGLT2s have relatively little evidence of hypoglycemia. And that's the good news with those. The incidence of hypoglycemia in those individuals is no higher than placebo uh, in that situation. So it doesn't seem to drive it as the sulfonylureas and insulin clearly drives hypoglycemia in that population. Other suggestions or comments? So we could go higher on the metformin. How high would you want to go? Two grams. Two grams? Yeah, OK. OK. Yes, so we could go higher on that. And metformin in the UK PDS trial, small subset of a couple hundred patients, uh, did show a reduction in cardiovascular mortality for metformin alone. When combined with sulfonylureas, it, it lost its benefit. But there was, during the trial, a reduction, and then follow-up 10 years after the trial, a continued reduction in mortality in the metformin-only group. Sub-analysis done retroactive. It was not a primary endpoint, so it never got recognized as a true clinical trial, and it was a small number of patients. But yes, I think ADA and all of us would recommend that formin for a type 2 diabetic would be certainly a, if not the starting medicine, certainly one we would want to add. And as mentioned earlier, if we were to use an SGLT2 in the EMPAREG trial, 75% of those individuals were already on metformin at the time. So a lot of that data is on the combination of the two. Other suggestions? Is it a, is it yeah. Yeah. So, Zetamide, good question. Is Zetamide listed uh, by Dr. Sky in his recommendations? Could be added because the LDL is 99. And this is a really high risk patient, already had an MI, clearly secondary reduction. You may want to go lower in that uh, situation. Interestingly, Yes, we'd like a lower LDL. I think we'd agree with that. Interesting, in the Zetamide trial that was done, that trial included individuals, or the entry was individuals who had had an acute myocardial infarction or event within 10 days. So we don't have the Zetamide data in someone who is one year out from their MI at this point in time uh, for that. We do have data with other agents that would further lower LDL, 
And that happens to be, as you all know, in the PCSK9s, which were, in fact, inclusion criteria you could have had an event within a year or so. So a one year out like this would be the type of patients that were included in Odyssey and the Fourier trial that showed a reduction, and they showed a 20 to 30% reduction in cardiovascular events. Took about a two, one or two years before you saw the separation occur, so it takes a little bit longer. And PCSK9s don't lower CRP, uh, C-reactive protein, the way statins do. So it may, it may be, uh, take a little bit longer for that effect to be there. And as Joe mentioned, there is a financial aspect associated with PCSK9s. The price has come down 60% in the last year uh, based on that, but it is still a cost. Uh, and for many of our patients and many of mine, uh, cost is still an issue. And if the insurance does not cover it, uh, it is hard for them to afford the copay or pay for it on their, on their own. How about a bile acid sequestrant? So, bile acid, which one would you recommend? Colocetylene. Okay. Um, and how uh, that would be uh, a, an additional thing that uh, has been shown. Um, I think uh, the issue there is side effects, which we've seen with uh, many of our patients. Um, how many people here have taken a bile acid sequestrant? Okay. I've taken it just to see. <laughs> <laughs> How many years ago? <laughs> Year, uh, this was years ago. Years my, yeah, okay. my, NP, my uh, PA challenged me to take it when we were on a trip. Uh, we both, uh, we were at a medical conference and uh, um, neither of us uh, successfully tolerated that, uh, that first round, especially when we had to share a room, so. <laughs> that was, uh, they made some improvements. Yeah, that. okay, okay. So that's certainly a consideration. And we used to rely on that a lot when we had very little because, as Joe mentioned, in the early days we had niacin and we had the sequestrants that were available and, and really nothing else that was prior to statins at that time. Many patients have tolerated it. Yes. Did you say already had pushed everything in cardiac rehab? Aha. Uh -huh. So we said multi factor risk reduction. So, yeah, diet, he needs diet. And, and not just say take a diet. You need counseling to do this diet. You need somebody to sit down with you, a certified nutritionist to sit and say, this is what you're going to have to have. And you need an exercise program. This individual qualifies for exercise. Many of our patients after an MI, they think about exercise, but it's hard to get them enrolled in, in compliance. So yes, a strict program where we get them exercising three times a week in a trained, with a certified trained uh, physiologist is important and nutritionist. Any other suggestions? What about a beta blocker? So beta blocker at this point, uh, beta blockers have been good in individuals with ongoing ischemia. Um, they have been good after myocardial infarction with reduced ejection fraction. Uh, if we assume his ejection fraction is reduced, yes, in the BHAT trial, that was beneficial. We have to tolerate or decide what blood pressure will accept with that related to uh, symptoms because we don't want to get uh, ischemia. Yes, from the back. Um, maybe switching to rosuvastatin at the highest dose? So rosuvastatin has a slightly higher reduction in LDL, so that would be a possibility. They're both generic at this time, so that's the nice thing is uh, for patients there's no excessive cost. Any other suggestions? Yes? Uh, do we have time to go to the group discussion? <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, So I just wanted to show you, this is Nathan Wong, who's a friend of mine, who uh, <coughs> was the president of the Society for Prevention, Cardiology Prevention. And uh, so his recommendations on this patient, this is, this is not Joe Biden, this is a different <laughs> Joe. Uh, 
Uh, recommend the DASH diet and 30 to 40 minutes of moderate exercise every week, three times a week. Uh, that's recommended. Uh, referral for lifestyle interventionalists. So this is more formal than we usually do to maximize diet and physical activity. Again, lifestyle modification. Ensure simultaneous multiple risk factor control. All those risk factors have to be checked off as we go down the list, not just one or two. Uh, empaglyphosin, again, because his A1C was high and he had heart failure at this point in time. So that's the one that hits both of those with 38 and 35% reductions for that. PCSK9, only because this is an individual for Zetamide who is not within 10 days of a uh, myocardial event or acute coronary syndrome. So in the Zetamide trial, the benefit or the in inclusion for someone with a very recent coronary event within 10 days. Um, target blood pressure under 130, although in diabetics, as I said, 140 versus 130 wasn't so clear for mortality reduction, but it did further reduce stroke in those individuals, and those would be his recommendations. So thank you very much for participating in this. We now have a quick uh, review. Claudine is going to go over a num number of things. Claudine uh, I <coughs> has been very effective for Right Care Initiative, and I wanted to uh, uh, read one thing about Claudine as she comes up, and that is she has participated in a number of things, but I thought the important thing is she's been very useful in turning inspiration to action. And the important thing here is she has worked with Right Care Initiative, Nike, and Daimler. So I wanted to put, repeat that again. Nike, Daimler, and Right Care. She goes with the great companies. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Palmer. And thank you, Dr. Sky, for such an uh, incredible I I'm just going to interrupt for a second to say she also has a PhD in epidemiology from Johns Hopkins and a very substantial history in uh, cardiovascular disease research. So thank you, Claudine, for helping us out here with facilitation. Thank you, Hattie. We'd love to do a lightning round and wear my running shoes.